Hope you guys can all hear me okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the first event of our series, Dancers Amplified Presents. Um, we thank you for your continued support of our organization and for taking the time out of your day to learn a little bit more about ballet's Black, Black history um, as another Black History Month comes to a close. For those of you who are not familiar with Dancers Amplified, we are a global artist-led organization united in empowering individuals, artists, and institutions fighting against so social justice and cultural equity in dance. Um, through resource sharing, our global active practices document, uh, community engagement, and virtual sessions like these, we are providing a space for artists to amplify their voices beyond their expansive physicalities and celebrate the brilliance of the entire dancer. Um, our team at Dancers Amplified uh, spans across the European Union and various states in the United States. Um, we would like to take this time to acknowledge that we are both on stolen land and currently residing in countries that have been complicit in the atrocious acts of genocide, colonization, imperialism, slavery, and currently violent acts of war. Um, the deep impact and trauma of oppression has shaped both our historical and present day communities. Before we begin our discussion, we would love to do a very quick um, grounding and breathing moment with each other. There's, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, we would like to take the time to share gratitude for being able to share this moment with each other and also to send some healing energy to those of us who are suffering right now and most vulnerable. Um, so please join me in taking some collective deep breaths. During this time, remember to unclench your jaw, drop your shoulders, relax your tongue in your mouth, feel your feet grounding through the ground and send some positive gratifying healing thoughts out into our community. We thank you for being here with us. Um, we are here together, we are here for you, and we're so happy you could be here today. Um, so before um, we begin, we just want to introduce our amazing and incredible team member, Jabrell Jackson. He is currently a Columbia PhD student who has also received his BFA in dance from the Juilliard School and MFA in dance from UC Irvine in California. He is a choreographer, filmmaker, activist, vocal artist, and was a professional dancer with the Dance Theater of Harlem, as well as, as engagements in the international community. Um, his scholarship work interrogates ballet's history as he explores and derives inspiration from the intersections of art, science, and spirit. In the cosmological compositions of William Shakespeare, the Moors of Al-Andalus, and the Shabaka Stone of Ancient Kush. Without further ado, I will pass it off to Jabril Jackson, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Gabby, and thank you all again for joining us. Um, I give thanks to the ancestors whose work I'm indebted to and who have guided me on this journey. I'm calling in from the Lenape land known to us as Manhattan, a land that was violently stolen, from the people that inhabited it. I wish peace on those all around the world who are not as fortunate as we are to sit here and have a talk over some slick technology and send prayers to all of those in turmoil that are televised and untelevised. So in the beginning of this research, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I started this research while I was in lockdown during the pandemic. Uh, it came in the wake of the back and forth that was happening between the Bolshoi Ballet and Misty Copeland um, with the rendering of Blackface in their Labayadere production. I had seen the production a little earlier in the year and was wondering why it didn't you know, make as big of an impact, but I'm glad that uh, Misty brought it to the attention of everyone. And I was very curious because I had heard a lot about the Moors um, from within, particularly the Black community. Um, but, and I'd also seen depictions of Moors in European contexts, and they didn't really line up. And so I decided to 
go down this rabbit hole of learning who the Moors were and what their contribution was to society. If we can go ahead and play the video. Um, and I was led down this journey after finding the research of Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, um, who I am infinitely indebted to um, for guiding me down this journey. And one of the videos was the when the Moors ruled in Europe. And here we have a clip from this BBC documentary. And I had seen this documentary, which was mind blowing. It's available on YouTube if you're interested. And the next day I took a ballet class. And when I stood in fifth position, it was like a lightning bolt hit my body because I immediately remembered these architectures, these structures, these designs, the, the, the cosmologies that were being described that were prevalent during this period of Al-Andalus where the Moors were governing Spain. And that sent me down this journey that I have not been able to return from for the last few years and that I have now decided to make my life's work as not only uh, does it make clear that there would be none of these things that we have in Western society, be it literature, music, uh, the novel, uh, uh, architecture, the sciences, the maths, and I'm arguing for, the, uh, for ballet as well, as we know it, without this period um, in Al-Andalus. So we can uh, go to the next slide. So I would like to cover these uh, three aspects of this research in particular. The specific point of absorption of the art of art forms of Al-Andalus into the French courts of Louis the 13th and 14th that include, but are not limited to the Sarabanda, Saraband. The cultural cosmology and compositional modes of Al-Andalus whose atomically interconnected worldview has a genealogy that extends beyond Greece to ancient Kush Kemet or ancient Egypt and the Shabaka stone of ancient Kush and how it contains and enacts the philosophies, sciences, atomic cosmology, and formerly classical artistic qualities that we will see make their way through Persia, Greece, Syria, India, and Al-Andalus before entering the courts of Europe. As a, as a disclaimer, this lineage I trace is one of many. I have not, for example, gone into further detail on the Indian, Persian, or Syrian contributions, but as the MTA voices say, if you see something, say something. This research field is wide open and I have chosen the particular objects I have chosen as they speak to me most as a person of African, Indigenous American, and Indian descent, as a scholar, and as an artist. To begin, let's look at the point of contact in the French court and work our way backwards in time and outward beyond the dance into the cultural and compositional milieu of Al-Andalus before homing in on an object that contains the principles that will be explored and developed in Andalusian art. I place particular focus on what seems to be an uninterrupted influence of geometrical principles, among others, that through, though integrated with other philosophical and cultural influences, occupies a central position in the practice and execution of classical ballet technique. In relation to Alonzo King's choreography and his perception of the foundations of the Western classical dance forms, Jill Nunez Jensen uses the concept of syncretism in her essay, Outlines for a Global Ballet Aesthetic, where Jensen elaborates on an idea that King's works are meant to showcase, quote, heterogeneity, all the while preserving longitudinally coherent lines through emerging out of distinct tradition. And she argues for, as opposed to hybridiz hybridization or, or uh, creolization. And the concept of syncretism is linked to ideas and philosophies and not biology, as is the case with hybridity and creolization. I further this use of syncretism in this analysis by arguing that this syncretism occurred over the centuries from that absorbed, maintained, transmitted scientific principles and philosophies of the ancient comedic mysteries through the major Greek philosophers, all the way to the Moors of Al-Andalus before being absorbed by classical ballet. These principles have only become more evident over the practice and expansion of the balletic form over the centuries. I posit that Andalusian dance forms like the Sarabanda and potentially the Chacon could be the vessels through which these African and Arabic principles enter Western classical dance. So uh, let's go ahead, go to the next slide. The singular origins of the Sarabanda are obscure. 
Um, oh, and here is the Shabaka stone uh, that has these, we will return to this in a minute, but it has the earlier iteration enactment and the spousal of these classical principles. So the next slide, sorry about that. So the singular origins of the Sadabanda are obscure. Uh, Robert Stevenson argues for 16th century New World origins that brought the Sadabanda to Spain via the trade ports of Seville. Daniel DeVoto argues for Andalusian origins, and Ralph P. Locke, like I do, argues that both could be true. Locke notes that the songs in Sadabanda form, quote, survive in Spanish sources from before 1522, and the other songs and literary mentions that are used to argue for New World origins found in Mexico between 1556 and 1569 also seem to appear to be of Spanish origin as their composers were born in Spain. The Oxford International Encyclopedia of Dance mentions roots that go far back as the Roman colonization and folk traditions of Catalonia. Aurelia Martin Cesares and Marga Gibaranco note that the synthesis of musical, choreographic, and cultural aesthetics that are speculated to be related to the Moorish Sambra and the Ghanaian Sarambeke, as well as indigenous American influences, all of which were in close contact with each other before Columbus's arrival to the New World and the expulsion of the Moors and Jews from Spain in 1492. Mara Leopo Juan Caraval notes a complicated and convoluted pre-Columbian mix of cultural influences. This pre-Columbian relationship is made more vivid with the presence of pyramids in the Americas and Shabaka designs in the Aztec calendar. If the Sadabanda potentially reaches back to Roman colonization, including that of Africa, is it possible that a particular shaping of this dance may have been derived from ancient Kush Kemetic origins and later influenced by the Sunni revival of the 12th century of Al-Andalus? If the earliest known Sadabandas seem to have come from Spain to the New World with this influence, it is possible that it was further amplified and synthesized with indigenous American cultures and their mixed race North and West African descendants who under varying circumstances traveled back to Spain via the trade ports and routes of Seville where it populated the public squares, playhouses and royal courts of Europe. It appears that the Spanish theater of the Renaissance played a pivotal role in solidifying the importance of the Sarabanda in Europe. These two hour plays were performed with interludes, which featured popular music and dance forms that could, and that could end or in or theatricalize real Corpus Christi processions out of the theater. One of these dances was the Sarabanda. Hugo A. Americo notes that despite its being banned publicly by Philip II in 1583 because of its lascivious nature and obscene lyrics, Spanish theater makers brought the Sarabanda into the theater in 1588 as they sought to represent the real lives of its surrounding community. In some cases, a Sadabanda would lead a Corpus Christi procession after its banishment as a kind of appeasing deterrent to the locals to avoid the dance, juxtaposing Africanist dances like the Sadabanda with more restrained music types and dance types. According to Leoba Juan Caraval, the Sadabanda rep represented a style of art that was quote, conceived more as a vital impulse that reflected life and nourished it as opposed to art for art's sake. The Sarabanda's reappearance and outstanding public reception after being banned repeatedly is an additional attestation of its massive popularity and immediacy. Well, in the 17th century, the courts of Louis the 13th and 14th absorbed and depicted Spanish and by default Moorish art and culture by appropriating the Sarabanda taken from the Spanish theater's Sarabanda. With the 1626 ballet Grand Bal de, of the Dowager of Bilbao and John Baptiste Lully and Moliere's comedy ballets of the 1660s, and you can move to the next slide, please, particularly their 1666 ballet de Muse, the French court ballets sought to integrate this Moorish dance into their own repertoires. Across Europe, as in France, the Saraband was associated with Spain, and Spain itself was reductively seen as an Africanized, miscegenated, and orientalized other, while the internally conflicted Spain had many anti moor Morisco treatises that associated the Sarabanda with the Moors and Moriscos, as it did the Chacon. Despite these tensions, the French ballets centralized the Sarabande, giving it climatic importance. In the libretto of Grand Ball, 
the section Sarabande de Espanol comes as the penultimate moment of the ballet, being called the Dance of Europe, that culminates a procession of various nations. Uh, next slide, please. It also cites the Granadines as the dancers of the Sarabande. Granada being the last remaining center of the Islamic rule of Spain before the expulsion of the Moors and Jews in 1492. In Grand Ball, King Louis XIII and other French nobility dressed as foreign nobles who performed their native dances at a ball given by the dowager and her fiance, Fan Fan de Sotville. Representatives from America, completing North and South America, Asia, completing Turkey and Persia, excuse me, Greenland, Friesland, as people of the North, North Africa, and after which Tartars make a brief appearance in Europe, all dance and sing. The final group of Europeans are from Granada, Spain, as we see here. The title of their entrances on pages 12 and 13 of the libretto, Ballets of, Ballets of Europe, the Grenadins, players of guitar, and the Grenadins, dancers of the Sarabande, confirm that early 17th century French courts associated the dance form with Al Andalus. How far this origin goes back is not made explicit, but pointing to Granada, one of the final centers of Al Andalus, instead of to Seville, where it was popular in the theater, or to the New World, further suggests that French ballet makers possibly associated the set of bond with Al Andalus and the Moors. This association is supported by a 1612 Spanish text, the Expulsión Justificada de los Moriscos Españoles, the Justified Expulsion of the Spanish Moors whose anti-Morisco description during the final years of the ethnic cleansing of the Moors and their converted Morisco descendants includes the Sarabanda in the list of their dances. Barbara Fuchs argument detailing the Moorish cultural and quotidian survivals in Spain well into the 16th century homes in on Granada as she cites Francisco Nunez Muley, who argues that Moorish practices were also the local Grenadian culture, end quote. Fuchs goes on to note, that from the late 15th century to the early 17th century, quote, travelers to Spain con constantly noted the Moorishness of Iberia and everything from its built landscape to its domestic practices to its costume, end quote. She points out the, particular, the peculiarity of Spain depicted by travelers as exoticized and somehow set apart from Europe, while Andalusian goods and culture were still prized as the, quote, gold standard of luxury. This makes a this makes a, a fascinating connection to Bilbao and the contemporaneous treatment of non-Europeans across France, Spain, England, Italy, and the colonized New World during the transatlantic slave trade, that each in their own ways absorbed the culture and labor of Africans and indigenous Americans with a blend of fear and desire. Fuchs surveys many aspects of Spanish culture and reveals that despite concerted efforts to erase their physical presence, the cultural, artistic, scientific and philosophical world of the Moors was so deeply enmeshed and foundational to Spain that it was rendered indiscernible and inextricable from Spanish identity. It took visitors from the surrounding European nations to note how African or Arabic the culture of Spain was well after the expulsion of the Moors into the 16th and 17th centuries. Kameda Goldberg reveals the complex relationships of Spain to its Moorishness, particularly in relation to flamenco. Uh, next slide, please noting that the Catholic Spain was at once repulsed by its ties to Al-Andalus and yet enamored with its rich history. Goldberg looks at the dynamics of the Catholic expulsion of the Moors, of the Islamic Moors that sought to erase the people, but kept the intellectual and cultural practices to cleanse them of their African and Arab origins. The African race was intimately tied to Islam and was therefore used as a signifier of blood that was impure and in need of redemption. This redemption through a kind of erasure of African ancestry could be embodied through dance. Both Goldberg and Fuchs note the impossibility of this erasure. This is also true of the Andalusian dance forms. Across Europe, a similar kind of construction of European national identity that was distinct from that of non-Europeans occurred, usually equating dark skin with the darkness of sin. Something interesting occurs in the associated images in the libretto of Grand Ball, however as we can go back to the previous slide drawn by Daniel Ravel. He does not darken the skin of the dancers, uh, yeah, there we go, uh, of the dancers as he does for the other nations, despite the French associating Spain with Africa. 
This could possibly indicate that the racial ambiguity that could be seen amongst the Spaniards or the wide range of Moorish skin tones. The word Moor was used much like the word black is in the 21st century to describe a person of certain or uncertain African descent who was likely mixed with Arab, Syrian, or other uncertain lineage. According to the many scholars, the According to many scholars, the spectrum of skin tones and phenotypes had a wide range from very dark skin to very light, with some Moors passing for white Europeans with blonde hair, again, likening the range of skin tones to that of modern day African Americans. Because of the Spanish Inquisition, limpieza de sangre or cleansing of the blood, and the expulsion of the Moors and Jews from Spain in 1492, I posit that Rebel's drawings reflect the ethnocultural erasure of Moors that accompanied the growing anti-Moor sentiment and deliberate, quote, cleansing of the blood or whitewashing, end quote, of Moorish cultural artifacts that was rapidly spreading across Europe through the 16th and 17th centuries. This would allow for a smoother integration and appropriation of the highly prized Moorish art and culture into that of the rest of Europe, allowing European nations like France to claim Andalusian art as its own. Whether the light skin of the Grenadines reflected light-skinned Moorish descendants, or whether it was a tactic to remove African and Arabic influences, the lineage from the dance form uh, of the dance form was traced to the age of the Moors around Andalus. However, like other aspects of Moorish or Andalusian culture, the Sarabanda was so loved by so many that it continued to be danced despite its connection to the Moors and despite its repeated prohibition in Spain. Though Rebel doesn't darken their skin, he does have them ordered in geometric symmetry and has three out of the four dancers markedly turned out. This turnout seems to be shared between the indigenous American, the African, and the Tartar depictions in dance and pedestrian states, suggesting some connection among these groups. This co what that connection is, I don't yet know. The other ethnic groups are more uniformly parallel or relaxed in their feet and body. The Sadaban dancers have the most torsions, spirals, and angles in their body that indicate three-dimensionality, where all of the other groups are two-dimensional. The use of turnout and additional three-dimensional vine-like spirals to the arms and head in this image make it the most balletic embodiment of the images, including images that evoke other European court dances like the Northern Europeans, whose arms and legs are more physically restrained. The presence of the botanical and geometrical embodiments lends the freshly absorbed Saraband a, a unique quality among the images, which is representative of its uniqueness as a dance in the period. Though the depictions of non-Europeans in this era are often contentious, the specificity of the Saraband's lineage to Granada in light of recent scholarship should not be ignored. The allusion to the Saraband's national and ethnic past in Granada, along with its physical distinctions like turnout, leads me to an earlier description of, of the dance that links geometric leg rotation, racial mixing, Africa, Islam, and indigenous America. Playwright Lobe de Vega, next slide please, has characters dance and speak of the Sarabanda, don blackface, and dress as a Moor and Mordo Indian. And so these are the two uh, books that I was citing earlier, Barbara Fuchs' Out of Nation and Kameda Goldberg's Sonidos Negros, if you want to look at this further. Uh, next slide, please. In his early comedy of, uh, in this early comedy of De Vega, the characters Leandro and Violente are in love and desire to marry each other. Unfortunately for Leandro, Violente is married to Patricio, who is also an unfaithful partner. To save Violente from dishonor and so that she can marry Leandro, Violente's father, Bellardo, murders Patricio by stabbing him in the buttocks. In act two of the play, Lucretio, seeking to cheer up Leandro from his woes, describes how the Sarabanda will take his mind off of his trouble. So here we have um, on the left, the original Spanish Castilian, and then on the right, we have Lucretius, don't be sad, tonight is going to be a Sarabanda that will dance until we can't any longer. To the sound of swaying and wagons, it's brave, gutsy or daring to set a bond in the open, bending the body well and turning the feet out or having feet with mixed blood or mixing the feet with good measure and with better grace. 
so as we're looking at these um, translations, I did this translation in collaboration with uh, Philip Lorenz. And there are a number of things that we noted. Um, this description carries many physical identifiers of the Sadabanda that predate its known entry into the French court. Sadabanda can also refer to shaking. So doing it hasta la cinta or until you can't any longer or until the belt seems to uh, allude to the exhausting dancing that people were noting and potentially the hip movements that were so detested by its early modern critics. The bravery it takes to dance the Sadabanda in the open also alludes to it being an illegal dance. The sexual innuendo of bending the body and hip shaking speak to its seeming lasciviousness. Sambo, like its derivative in America, Sambo, a racial slur against Black Americans or people of African descent, was often a derogatory term for racial others. In the OED, um, the Spanish Sambo was applied uh, in America and Asia to Persians, to persons of various degrees of mixed African and Indian or European blood, perhaps identical with Sambo, meaning bandy-legged, um, and other sources say bow-legged. This description specifies ethnicity, but the other meaning of bandy or bowed legs either means that everyone who would dance the Sarabanda would need to have rickets, or what is more likely, that the bandy bowed legged effect was created by the dancers rotating their femurs outward to create the bowed effect, an action clearly shown in the Dowager of Bilbao. If De Vega intended for both meanings of Sambo to be read at once as a literary person in his description of the Sarabanda, then he was actively denoting both ethnicity and physical action, which suggests that there may have been an association between blackness and leg rotation, and that the Sarabanda could have played a role in shaping the conventions relating to turnout in the court dances of the Renaissance. His use of compas in relation to this point is essential as it can refer to a measure or rhythm in music, but also measurements in degrees with a mathematical compass, as well as a directional compass. This would allow for the rotation of the legs to be ordered geometrically and as it says, gracefully, as well as musically. This may also clarify how the foot to floor relationship and pathways of the feet in Western classical dance forms mimic that of a mathematical and or directional compass, structuring the feet much in the same way that Islamic shabaka patterns are structured. So if everyone, if you don't mind, if you will, you don't have to, but just feel, you can stand wherever you are, you don't have to turn your camera on or anything, but just feel the difference between what it is to try to move your hips with your legs parallel and then turning the feet out. You can be in first position or open and then feel the kind of freedom of moving your hips in this way. And it seems to me logical that if you're gonna dance, you want the most ease and, and freedom and mobility and leg rotation facilitate for this um, hip action that many people spoke of of the period in relation to the dance. Later, um, Lucretius speaks the most about the Sadabanda in an act, and in act three returns on stage, next slide please, dressed as a Moor, one of the many moments of role play in this play, then potentially in a form of blackface. Another character, Roberto, comments on his appearance. And so here we see uh, these stage directions, that have people coming in and uh, Roberto uh, says, how well Lucretius goes in the way of the Moor, Moorish or Morisca. It looks like Amuza himself vanished. And this is, uh, everyone has returned on stage and we have a number of people dressed in, um, let's see, we have an Indian, we have a shepherd and a motley fool as well. So when I corresponded with Philip Lorenz about this text, he noted that the stage directions of the Spanish theater were not as codified as that of later traditions, like in England, for example. So the order of the list of names and the costumes may not necessarily correspond in a one-to-one -one relationship. If seen in a strict relationship, Lucretia should be the one in the Motley Fool. This would also be interesting, especially in relation to K. Goldberg's exploration 
of Harlequin and Harlequin Friday as early iterations of depicting people of African ancestry. But the characters announced that Lucretius is the Moor, likened to the banished Musa. So this is the train I will follow. The banishment likely refers to the Spanish Inquisition and more specifically, Musa in Ibn Nusayr, who was the Umayyad governor and Arab general who ruled the Muslim provinces of Africa or North Africa and directed the Islamic conquest of Visigoth Spain. He became the subject of many later Spanish poems. This specific evocation of Musa ibn Nusayr and the expulsion of the Moors connects the Sarabanda in Islam through the character of Lucretia. Later in Lully's 1666 Ballet de Muse, Lully uses a series of Sarabands for his masquerade at Bignot that are centralized in the action of the ballet to depict the true national character of Spain and honor the marriage of Louis XIV to his cousin, the Infanta Maria Teresa of Spain. In 1658, Lully would also use the Chacon as a dance for Moors. The Chacon moved in tandem across Europe with the Sarabanda as a dance that was associated with Moors and Africans. According to Albert Cohen, Lully gradually incorporated Spanish techniques and compositional practices, including those of the Spanish Sarabanda into his own, becoming less concerned with depicting the national character of Spain as Lully was a choreographer as well. I submit that the same thing must have occurred with the dance form. Goldberg joins many scholars in her acknowledgement of the French theater's debt to the Spanish, the of the French theater's debt to the Spanish theater, particularly that of Moliere and Lully. However, she goes further with acknowledging the debt of the Spanish theater to the Moors and, African, uh, and the African diaspora. She details the inbred family dynamics and the lineages of the Spanish and French courts, among others, which includes Louis XIII, who performed in Bilbao. In the court of his son, Louis XIV, who continued the tradition of marrying his cousin, the absorption of Spanish and by default Moorish aesthetics and art forms was only amplified in the hands of Moliere and Lully. Goldberg points out that the long history of dances de bladas or spoken dances in Spain and the subsequent bailes cantados, sung dances in Spain were unusual in France and that it connects these traditions to Moliere's uh, comedy ballets, many of which were made in collaboration with Lully, Pierre and Pierre Bouchamp that are directly modeled on the Spanish Commedia. Many of these ballets starred Louis XIV. Anne of Austria, Louis XIV's mother, sister of reigning Spanish King Philip III, and aunt to the Infanta Maria Teresa, was Spanish herself, and according to Albert Cohen, was largely responsible, quote, as queen and later regent of France for an increase in Spanish influence at the Sp French court during the minority of Louis XIV. This influence nevertheless engendered a flurry of courtly interest in the qualities of Spanish national character, which found expressions in dress, language, decor, theater, music, and dance, end quote. Cohen notes that the Spanish dance was a prevalent form of the time. The Masquerade de Espanol is a series of sarabans and dances that maintain the characteristics of sarabans. It occupies a central role in ballet de muse and intentionally evokes the national character of Spain. In the comedies, Lully influ infuses specific qualities and techniques unique to those employed by the Spanish theater and more frequently and more distinctly than the other nations that were depicted, with the only exception being Italy, the place of his birth, and another country with a past deep in Moorishness, but that's for another talk. Cohen details the Spanish qualities employed when describing the next ballet uh, Lully was involved with, Ballet de Nations which is set in Sarabande rhythm and later in the rhythm of the Spanish jig. Uh, next slide, please. These qualities include internal motivic uh, repetitions, sequences, syncopated rhythms and hemiolas, and improvisations which point to the musical practices of Al-Andalus that were embedded in Spanish culture. You can go ahead and uh, play the video. The Spanish theater uh, troupe Comedia de Espanol spent a decade performing in and collaborating with Lully and Moliere on their comedy ballet. There are even works that appear to have not been written by Lully himself, but possibly by one of his Spanish collaborators. By 1670, the Italian and Spanish performers that were involved in the comedy of the previous dance 
were sent home, leaving the French performers to portray the foreign nations by themselves, a practice that was very much in vogue in the early modern court. Like in Dowager, many of the nations and racialized others were depicted in Louis' Louis ballets, including the Moors. Despite employing their aesthetic techniques that were absorbed by the Spanish theater, described in Cohen as reflecting the solemnity, nobility, pride, reserve, sentiment, and romance of Spanish character, not as a set of exotic foreign quality, but rather as a sensitive rendering of the genuine expression of the Spanish nation, end quote. The depictions of the Moors and other nations were stereotypical and derogatory, unlike what we see here. Cohen states that foreign traditions fascinated the French and that Europe as a whole, um, and, and fascinated the French in Europe as a whole in a very active way. Many of the descriptions attributed to the Moors were interchangeable with those of neighboring and distant lands, including but not limited to theft, buffoonery, sexual immorality, and savagery in the European imagination. By this point, a clear separation of the art from the people that engendered it has happened, and the split would continue to grow through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment that would intentionally and repeatedly divorce the Africanist traditions and the sciences from the Africanist people that it, um, under which it was born and developed. Eventually, Lully incorporated the techniques of the Spanish into his own compositions, even beyond the practice of employing Spanish dances wholesale, principally the Sarabande, the Pavan, the Spanish jig, and the Canary. The specific references to the Spanish de decreases, as does the particular attention to depicting Spanish national character. The influence, however, remains as many of the Spanish qualities described above continue to accompany the subsequent sarabands composed by Lully and the composers that he influenced. I argue that Lully being both, excuse me, composer and choreographer also ensured that the qualities of the physical dances that he choreographed or collaborated with others who were choreographing were as close to legitimate as the music that he was composing and collaborating with it with the Spanish artist to create. I posit that the same kind of synthesis happened with the music of Lully happened in the DNA of Western classical dance, not just in the works of Lully, but also in the court culture of Europe in general, as the Sarabanda experienced popularity in the other influential nations of the Renaissance and Baroque. A potentially key absorption is turnout, its codification in geometric degree scales and the physicalization of, geom of geometry internally and its spatial inscription. And so we have just seen uh, the Sarabande from Lully uh, in 1670. And in it, um, it might've been difficult to note, but uh, there are a lot of things that carried over into how we practice ballet today, um, though it is very different. Um, you might've noted the spirals, the geometries and the feet, the geometric inscriptions on the ground and things like that. But it didn't necessarily try to depict a nation. It simply performed the dance and the qualities of this dance. So next slide, please. So yeah, by that time, um, he would have fully absorbed the Sadaban into just creating dances and music. So Edward Fanfax, Edwin Fairfax, surveys the French and Italian dancing manuals of the period and reveals a stark change from the manuals prescribing parallel feet before the year 1600 to geometrically turned out legs after 1600 that coincides with the absorption and growing popularity of the Sarabande across Europe after its appearance, prohibition, and reappearance on the Spanish theater stage in the 1580s. Extant sources reveal parallel feet were prescribed before 1600 but by 1600, Italian dancers, quote, no longer conformed at least at time to the old prescribed practice of generally dancing with the feet more or less parallel, end quote. He cites Fabrito Caroso, who urges dancers to avoid having, quote, one foot look south and the other look north so that it seems that one's feet are naturally crooked, end quote. The parallel prescriptions were pervasively replaced with turned out legs and dancing manuals by the middle of the 17th century. By this time, some dancing masters asked for the feet to be quote, quite turned out 
so that the toe of the right foot comes to be turned straight out to the right side and that the toe of the left foot straight out to the left side so that the knees and toes come to point outwards to both sides, almost under the shoulders." End quote. There was a nuanced range of desired leg rotation that used orthogonal terms like right angles for pre their prescription. The coterminous occurrences of the popularity of the Sadabanda, the geometric turnout of the Sadabanda, the shift from parallel to geometrically turned out legs in early dance manuals, as well as the inscription of cardinal and ordinal directions, the compass-like designs and floored botanical spirals on the floor point to the Sadabanda as one of the potential carriers of Andalusian artistic aesthetics and mathematical philosophies into the French court. This geometric preoccupation may also clarify how the foot to floor relationship and the pathways of the feet in classical ballet mimics that of a mathematical and or directional compass, structuring the feet in the way that Andalusian visual art patterns seen here, like the Shabaka, uh, patterns, which is Arabic for grid, net, or web, and the Mercanas or honeycomb designs are structured. And we see here these designs, this design on the left from the Alhambra. Many of these designs include an eight-pointed star, uh, next slide please, which signifies the heavens and creation that seems to provide the floor pattern for the personal square of ballet, the embodiment of geometry, a foundational component of ballet from European courts to the 21st century has continued to extend and expand and turn the body into a geometric compass through the centuries to produce geometries within itself and in space that embody a number of principles that we will explore further, including the finite and the infinite. Techniques and principles that are also found in the art forms across Al-Andalus. To posit an Andalusian source for the geometric base and formal preoccupations of ballet technique, one can examine the various artistic manifestations and cultural cosmologies of Al-Andalus. Next slide, please. Whose synthesis of art, science, philosophy, and religion explored concepts of an atomically interconnected universe through geometries and fractalized subdivisions, particularly after the Sunni revival of the 11th and 12th centuries the Andalusian polymaths geometrically explored and depicted their atomic cosmology through architecture, visual art, music, and literature. In Chewbacca design, the Rub el Hib, or the Islamic eight-point star, symbolizes the heavens, while depicted in the Chewbacca stone, though the star itself doesn't have eight points, are eight principles of divine order, embodied by eight naturu, or the uh, essences or pure ideas that fuel creation, matter, space, infinity, the finite, light, darkness, the seen, and the unseen. I think I missed one. Many of these principles, including that of opposing forces to, accord, to acquire balance, are principles of ballet, also much like Shabaka design. The Shabaka stone accompanies the scientific theological image with cosmological inscriptions that contextualize the image as one of cosmic influence and significance. An argument could be made that this cosmic framing of geometric formalism was also employed in the early court ballets that sought to bestow divine power on the starring monarchs like Louis XIV through the architecture of the sets, three-point perspective, or turn, uh, a pyramid that is turned from orienting to the cosmos to an individual, as well as the dances of the king itself, as his dancing capabilities were meant to intimidate his onlookers. Or it could, as was the case with the Andalusians, cause a dancer, I mean, cause a spectator to feel the demonic potential of a dancer. However, also in each case, the formalism of the designs on the Shabaka stone and in Shabaka patterns and in the dances like the Sarabanda are at once standalone scientific treatises theological, philosophical exegeses, and artistic masterpieces that enact the work of their cosmologies within their formal structures and phenomenologically on the viewer. Many of the aesthetic, theoretical, and theological and cosmological scientific principles of the Shabaka stone appear to have made their way seamlessly into Shabaka patterns that share their geographical and temporal lineage with atomism, the evolution of star patterns, frame tail narratives, and the development of music theory that were all absorbed by the West. 
The migration of the Tuambuti people and the shared cosmology with Sumer, along with the shared star iconography and accompanying cosmological inscriptions would help explain the transmission of the concepts, science and imagery from ancient Kush and Sumer through Persia, Syria, Baghdad and Al-Andalus as the locations were all within reach of each other and in constant trade, traffic and migration. According to some scholars like Dana Reynolds, the African Moors and Arabs share a common ancestry to the Kushite kingdom that dispersed after its decline and appear and apparently had direct access to comedic wisdom that bypassed its Greek adoption. This would also explain the importance of the Andalusian scholars being the bearers of Greek wisdom to Europe as they shared the knowledge from the same source. The pool of influence in this tradition is rich, deep, and found its manifestation across the arts in Al-Andalus in their own ways. Each art form divides and subdivides the materials of its medium into complex artistic treatises on existence, much like how the body is subdivided in ballet, be it the plots of stories, tiles, stucco, loot strings, or sound itself. The divided parts are interwoven together to create atomic and geometric nets visually, sonically, or conceptually. Next slide, please. Kalam, defined by Yasser Taba as the science of rational argumentation that provided a common language for uh, theology, philosophy, and science was fundamental to the growth of each branch of intellectual and artistic inquiry. It reached across the Islamic world, established and developed by Syrian Mutazilite and Asherites who believed in an atomically interconnected universe and ricocheted through each successive Islamic court, uh, in Islamic empire. Guru Nisipaglu argues that the Sunni revival during this period provided a fertile ground for philosophical ideas to emerge as many of the Islamic subgroups were in theological disputes. The unifying of these cosmologies may have, quote, engendered, uh, next slide please, engendered a new way of representing the material world, end quote. Taba and Nisipaglu agree on the qualities of these visual and mathematical patterns and their linkage between the Asheri occasionalistic view of the universe and the growth of arabesque patterns that dissolve surfaces and volumes while directing a meditative gaze into the transience of the created world, which could see, be seen in these botanical flower and floral uh, green patterns and the permanence of the creator, which can be seen in its geometric precision. They also agree on the synchronicity of the developments in the Islamic calligraphy in the 11th and 12th centuries, in the creation of the Giri Persian for not ornamental mode, a mode of interlaced vegetal forms and interlocked geometric shapes and patterns. End quote. The created world is represented by the botanical vines that weave throughout Chewbacca patterns and the permanence, order and exactitude of the creator are shown in the precision of the geometric patterns. Uh, next slide, please. The earliest origins of the Chewbacca patterns and their advanced forms, particularly in the Jirdi mode are found in Syria in the craftsmanship of polymaths like al muhandis or the geometrist who studied during his time Euclid, the Almagest, astronomy, medicine, hadith, which are traditional sayings of the prophet Muhammad, grammar, and wrote treatises on science and literature. Uh, next slide, please. It appears that such polymaths were fairly commonplace in the medieval Islamic empire, particularly during the 11th and 12th century. The two-dimensional st uh, atomic stars like the five-point star representing the five pillars of Islam and the eight-point star or Rub el hiz also known as the Islamic star, are common features that pervade Islamic art. These atomist patterns found across the art forms of the period share a lineage that can be traced in parallel fashion from Al-Andalus all the way back to Kemet. So here we can see the different fractalized states of these stars. And the, the first uh, slide, you saw the two-dimensional iteration of the eight points and with each zoom out, you see how the fractals, meaning you know, one thing being contained within the other, but it still reflects the whole. So it, it, this, this kind of thing was pervasive throughout the, the art of the period. Let's see. Uh, yeah, and so the Kush Kemetic 
uh, Shabaka stone also has these star patterns um, with these interconnected spokes and atomic particles between the spokes. And that is engraved with the creation story and woven throughout. So in the study of the Hall of Two Sisters, what we're looking at here, Mercana Stone in the Alhambra, Yasataba surveys how these atomistic and mathematical concepts reach across the architecture, music, and literature of the early modern Mediterranean. In his exploration, Taba opposes Oleg Grabar's assessment of the Mercana Stone in the Alhambra that takes for its point the study, a point of study, the inscription surrounding the dome rather than as what uh, Taba and I do, which is looking at the particular formal qualities of the dome itself. Um, but it is agreed that these domes represent the rotating domes of heaven. And as we search for the meaning within itself, um, citing the difficulty which, using, which uses uh, the often unavailable evidence can be used to explain some of the Mercanus domes but not the phenomena in general, if we just use the inscriptions outside. But the idea, as Taba suggests, of subdividing matter into tiny interrelated segments implied a certain attitude toward matter, or more specifically, that the division of a dome into segments implied a certain conception of not just the dome, but its referent, the universe, and that the Mercanus dome is an architectural manifestation of its, this thoroughly orthodox Islamic concept. End quote. He posits Baghdad as the likely origin of the practice in the early 11th century, which is a common site that we will return to repeatedly in the succeeding artistic lineages. Taba also argues that though there is some overgeneralization of the claim that there is a unified cultural and compositional cosmology by some scholars, there is certainly evidence that the occasionalist concept permeated Islamic culture and that it can be seen in, quote, parallel developments across the 11th and 12th centuries in architectural ornament, the arabesque and overall star patterns, and even in music with the increasing embellishment around the common mode that are also explainable in terms of occasionalist concepts, end quote. He cites ethnomusicologist Mahmoud Guitat, who addresses improvisation and emb embellishment in Islamic Tunisian music. But I will turn our focus to that of the compositional musical practices in Al-Andalus that entered European courts later. But I will first, music, uh, first address musical practices. In addition to the transmission of instruments, uh, next slide please, from one culture to another, music theory practices were also passed down. Dwight Reynolds speaks specifically about the concepts of quote, music as mathematics and quote, music of the spheres in theory, composition and practice in Al-Andalus and across the Islamic territories. In his analysis, he illuminates the view of music being a tool through which people could achieve a clearer understanding of the cosmos and that musical intervals could be expressed as mathematical ratios. He uses an example of the division and subdivision of a string into ratios that correspond to mathematical tones in the same ratios to each other. Um, sorry, is there... I'm hearing something. I don't know if I didn't know if somebody was trying to tell me something. Someone is off me. Okay, I guess not. Um, and yes, uh, and that the corresponding pitches uh, describes their organization uh, into modes uh, or a scale with particular characteristics. How these modes, uh, these modes were also associated with specific emotions and moods. And there was a cultural belief that these uh, playing this music would cure or alter the emotions, moods, or humors of its listeners. The detail of the dissection of pitch and the matter that produces the pitch, as well as the mathematical consistency across their pitches and their specific effect on the emotions and spirit of the listeners highlights the acuity with which these musical systems were developed with microscopic detail and scientific empiricism. And it examples how the fields of art, science, and philosophy, and theology were linked inextricably at their core. He tracks these theories from Al-Andalus to ancient Greece and shows that the arithmetic, quote, simplicity of determining the basic intervals seemed to the Pythagoreans to be an indication that mathematical principles were at work in the very structure of the cosmos, end quote. 
These concepts were most known to be derived from Greek music theory, most notably Pythagoras, though Reynolds himself notes that, quote, no texts attributed to Pythagoras have survived and may have never existed, end quote. These concepts are attributed to Pythagoras, uh, though they, like frame tales and these other traditions, according to scholars like Ivan Van Sertima, George G.M. James, and Joseph Horowitz, have roots in Kemet. In another ex examination, Reynolds explores the culture of Keon, or courtly seeing women, that were trained, sold, and traded, and married to their kings across the Islamic world. The primary centers for training of Keon were in Baghdad, Medina, and Cordoba, and later Seville, and many of these singers came from North of Africa. The role and skills of Keon are embodied in the character of Scheherazade of 1001 Nights, to be discussed later who appears to depict most closely the tradition of Keon of Al-Andalus than those of their Middle Eastern counterparts, despite the main frame story being set in the peninsulas, quote, of India and Indochina, end quote. Unlike those in Al-Andalus, the Keon of Baghdad are not known to have been trained in fields outside of music and poetic performance and composition. Um, Jerome Clinton states that Scheherazade, quote, acquired what, it, what was a rare accomplishment in a woman, a solid knowledge of poetry and of history, particularly of kings and uh, of nations and of other times, end quote. However, Reynolds reveals that in the, in the 11th century, anecdotes of Keon being trained in the East become scarce and that this coincides with the shift to a, quote, golden age of Keon training in Al-Andalus. This also coincides with the Sunni revival and the presence of Andalusian polymaths like Ibn Baja dispersing treatises on music theory that included mathematical concepts and atomism, which became the standard for musical production. Reynolds also notes that Baja's concepts also share affinities with North African music theory from centuries earlier that could also potentially point to revival of a more ancient North African tradition. The training of Keon seems to have come to be done exclusively in Seville, Spain, where the Serabanda was made famous. And according to a number of anecdotes from the period, likely included a training of remarkably diverse set of fields, including not only the, the performance arts, but also physical sciences, Quranic recitation, and even weaponry, end quote. These Kian were then sent to other locations throughout the Maghrib and the Mashriq, or the Middle East. The musical and literary practices of Kian were intimately linked in Al-Andalus, an example of this occurrence, I posit, is the 14th century Islamic assemblage of the 1001 Nights. Next slide, please. I argue that not only can the content of the story be used to example the kind of rich, artistic, and intellectual medieval world um, of, is, of Islamic Spain, particularly that of Al-Andalus, but that it is, its very compositional structure is composed of the same systems that construct the Hall of Two Sisters Dome in the Alhambra and its wall tiling. The Knights is a frame tale narrative that features tales set across the Islamic world, and many are set in Al-Andalus, Syria, and Egypt during the golden age of intellectualism while under Moorish or Islamic rule from 711 CE to 1492 CE. The 14th century manuscript was developed, expanded, rearranged, and made popular across the Islamic speaking world at the peak of this time in which the arts and sciences were inseparable. Comparing the Knights with the Hall of Two Sisters dome in the Alhambra and its wall tiling, and if we allow for this mathematical format of the Knights storytelling structure, as well as the content of the stories that include historic, historical characters, including polymaths and rulers, both partly and common, and scientific knowledge to be attributed to a polymathic Scheherazade as a fictional representation of an Andalusian Keon in the 14th century iteration of the Knights, then we could feasibly posit that the Knights is an additional example of this cultural cosmology of Kalam atomism being manifested in the visual, performing, and literary art of the period. So literature circulating in and around Al-Andalus seemed to contain all of these qualities and were interconnected in this kind of atomic, uh, this kind of Kalam atomic formation. Frame tales themselves are stories that contain smaller stories within them that may or may not be related to each other in the larger frame in which it's held, like fractals. Though there are frame tales that are found in Kemet, frame tales are believed to have traveled from India 
through Persia, Syria, and Al-Andalus and into Europe, eventually becoming the novella and eventually then becoming the novel. The most studied frame tale narratives are believed to have been first written in India in works like the Panchatantra, the third century, and traveled through Syria in works like Vikram and the Bedal, uh, developed and disseminated through Al-Andalus in the Thousand and One Nights, and as we see here in Kalila and Dimna, and further developed in Spain, Italy, France, and England by authors like Cervantes, Boccaccio, Marguerite de Navarre, and Cha Chaucer, respectively. This lineage of the frame tale narratives is mirrored by the adoption of many arts and sciences like geometry that prior to their introduction to the Mediterranean and Europe were unknown or underutilized in the Latin speaking world. Using one literary pillar as example, Ibn al uh, we can see how these literatures were constructed and developed. Mukafa was an Iranian Andalusian writer, scholar, and translator who is said to have translated both the 1001 Nights and the Persian tale, Kalila and Dimna, from Persian and Sanskrit to Arabic. These stories were later translated into Spanish, Italian, French, German, and many other languages because of their immense popularity due to a perceived dearth of literary merit in Europe. These works were also absorbed by Europe to do many things, including establish their own literary superiority as in the Spanish and Castilian translation of Kalila and Dimna by Alfonso the Great, or to establish distinctions of European national identity and the exotic other, as in the French translation of 1001 Nights by Antoine Galland under Louis XIV. That would be the catalyst for the explosion of Orientalism across Europe. We would not have the novel or fiction as we know it without the influence of these works. In relation to Andalusian influence on European literature, Madeleine Doby states that while scholars, quote, agree that Muslims played a crucial role in preserving and transmitting the scientific and philosophic heritage of ancient Greece, and Al-Andalus was the principal center of this transmission, the claim that Arabic literature had an impact on the development of Europe's vernacular literary tradition is treated with circumspection. From an ideological standpoint, it is of course far more e far easier to accept that Muslims preserved and refined Greek ideas than to acknowledge that Arabic works played a significant role in shaping Europe's linguistic and literary heritage." End quote. Doby argues that the contact zones would be, meeting, would be meeting places of cultural, scientific, and artistic exchange and shouldn't be restricted to moments of geographic contact, as we have already seen with the courts of Louis the uh, sorry, 13th and 14th, but also through the more abstract and nuanced transmission of ideas across translation, linguistic absor absorption, and mutually active cultural syntheses. Thinking about the pervasive geometries of Andalusian art, I came upon a number of five-point stars in the linkage of the tales, uh, as well as fractalized tales within tales that imply infinity, as does the very title, A Thousand and One Nights. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we also see that uh, there are many, not only just frames within frames, but there are rhythmic repetitions, as we saw earlier in the Alhambra, of themes, paragraphs, and sentences that are also fractalized. Uh, next slide, please. And so here we see one of these repetitions. Um, at the end of each night, uh, there is a long story that, uh, that tells how they end the night, and how they start the next day before returning to storytelling. And that paragraph gets smaller and smaller and smaller from they, uh, please sister, if you're not sleepy, tell us one of your tales. Sometimes the king speaks, sometimes he doesn't. And by the end of the tale, we see the fractalized version of the following night Scheherazade said, that's the only thing that it says, but it contains all of the information that we have acquired across the tale. Uh, next slide, please. And so here uh, I drew this map of uh, one of the tales of the uh, hunchback, uh, which creates a five point star, or which symbolizes the five pillars of Islam, the profession of faith, the prayer, alms, fasting, and pilgrimage. Uh, these pillars are at once the core of Islamic belief and are the basic practices that Joseph Lombard reveals can be seen as a means by which a human being returns to their primordial nature, um, where they are ever cognizant of the, their covenant with God. When observed with sincerity, the rites 
of Islam, these, those in Judaism and Christianity serve to reintegrate and reorient the dispersed elements of one's human nature. And so here we can see that from the story of the hunchback who has direct contact with the Christian tradesman, the Muslim steward, the Jewish physician, and the tailor's wife, uh, each of those individuals meet him with a story of their own. And um, the, the story is very funny. If you haven't read it, it is, it is very funny that the hunchback dies with the tailor and his wife, and they pawn him off onto the Jewish physician, who then pawns him off to the Muslim steward, who then pawns him off to the Christian tradesman, each of them believing that they killed the hunchback, but only, you know, the hunchback uh, has died only under the hands of the tailor and the wife, who, having fun with him one night, tried to eat a fish whole. Um, and so human nature, the pillars of Islam, and their application are overarching themes and topics of discussion throughout the tales. A further discussion of this uh, would be required for each of these tales listed here could exemplify an aspect of each pillar as they certainly seem to. This complex construction subliminally depicts an interconnected universe on the largest and smallest levels. Uh, next slide, please. The macroscopic universe is composed of and reflects its smaller interrelated parts. The notion of creation and the manifestation and its manifestation can be seen in the pre-Islamic visual art of Persia and Syria with the star designs and interrelated fractals. And so here uh, I have a few of the stories, each of them having points, a number of them having five points going to and from each other um, and how they resemble, uh, next slide, uh, the tiles, the construction of the tiles on the Alhambra walls. The Shabaka patterns not only derive their principles from the predecessors of Greece and Kemet, but also from the Quran. Uh, next slide, please. Shabaka designs are informed by the accumulation of the verses uh, within, oh yes, here's the lineage that we can see of uh, Syria. We have an Indian uh, votive there and we have the Shabaka stone and how we have these same kind of principles of interweaving uh, patterns with star designs, wheels, um, and each of them have their own kind of relationship to their cosmologies and to their view of creation. Next slide, please. We're almost there, y'all. Um, so, uh, the verses within, let's see, the book including its uh, materiality of its textual structure and even the orthography are important in the construction of the Quran. It is said of the Quran that the whole of the Quran is contained in Al-Fatiha or the opening. The whole of Al-Fatiha is contained within the Bismillah, which is the opening line of the chapter. Uh, Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, or in the name of God, the compassionate and the merciful. This formula is Arab, in Arabic, it begins with the letter Ba. The whole of the Bismillah is contained within the letter Ba, which looks like an upside down T with a dot below the horizontal line. And the whole of the letter Ba is contained underneath the Ba in the dot. And so the, the theology behind that is that the word of God comes down through that line. It is dispersed across the world and it is dispersed by the dot. And we as individuals are that dot. And many of these qualities were that were prized in Al-Andalus were inherited from earlier Middle Eastern and Greek cultures. The principles of classicism, for example, are attributed to the Greeks and the mathematically atomic worldview to Pythagoras. However, it is often overlooked that Pythagoras, Aristotle, and Plato, among others, attribute their learning to having studied in Kemet or ancient Egypt, whose extant artifacts that predate the prominent Greek philosophers contain and enact these principles in their stories and in their former qualities. Next slide, please. The Shabaka stone of ancient Kush of the 25th Kemetic uh, or Egyptian dynasty created in 710 BCE contains the seeds of atomism, geometry, and the other aforementioned, aforementioned traditions in one artistic, scientific, and theological object. And looking at the stone, we can see a star pattern with many interconnected smaller stars, which compose the image of an atom well before modern technology to do so. 
As a side note, uh, scholar Peter Liu has shown that the Shabaka designs in the Giri mode not only resemble modern images of atomic crystals, uh, as now we have pictures of atomic crystals, but they also abide by the same numerical laws. And here, these principles that are transmitted through the creation story are carved into the stone, which are balance, order, reciprocity, infinity, the finite, etc., are displayed and enacted by the Medunetr, renamed hieroglyphs by the Greeks in their detailed composition. And the word atom seems to be derived from the creation story of atum that is nested in the frame of the Memphite theology's discovery. It is a frame tale in and of itself. Uh, next slide, please. And so here, Oh yeah, let's go back to the stone, please. And so here uh, we can see the stone and all of the little points, the, the fractalized points, the lines, the planes, the angles, and atomism and creation, all of which are contained within this stone and exampled through the stone. The Shabaka stone is an ancient comedic artifact that is dated to um, potentially 710 BCE, uh, that records an earlier theology, possibly from the 18th or 19th dynasty, or even further back, as argued by other, uh, by some scholars, from the Old Kingdom. And it was named after the pharaoh that founded Shabaka. The stone and its history and its design are perplexing and obscure to many Western Orientian scholars, and it is only preserved. It is the only preserved document of this religious text, and contains what is called the Memphite theology of creation. Some argue that the stone was created as propaganda to assuage the newly conquered kingdom of Memphis towards accepting its new ruler who had incorporated their deities into their dominant theology. Others like Kia Tezua, uh, Louis Aluka, who studies the congruity and contiguousness of African indigenous religions and their likely root being in a comedic cosmological argument, posit that the KRC or the comedic cosmological argument uh, view holds a henotheistic perspective that each system of deity ultimately represents a manifestation of the same most high God. It is also uncertain how old this theology is, but Kaya Hi Kaba Hiawatha Kamene convincingly argues that the stone preserves the theology of their ancestors, the Twa Mbuti people or Anu people, who are derogatorily called pygmy people, who first peopled the earth through migration and establishing the ancient civilizations of Asia, including China, India, the Philippines, and Japan. He argues that along with establishing these varying societies, they were the inner mind that Kush Kemet became the tongue for, revealing that, quote, Kemetic writings belong to Africa's intellectual and cultural traditions introduced by the inner African Kush nation, and that the philosophical system, literature, and utterances of the Twa, Kush and Pharaonic Kemet are identical and belong to the same astronomical, spiritual, philosophical, mythological, and educational system, only differing by degree. And that the Shabaka stone was a documentation of a much older cosmology, end quote. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And so here we can see the principles of creation being acted in the first few lines of this stone and that we have the Ankh being at the center of the stone, which is a symbol of life and the soul. And that on either side of the Ankh, if we move outward, we have these mirroring hieroglyphs that reflect each other in balance, in order, and that have these, uh, the, have enact the same balance that we will see the Greeks espouse, that we will see held in, this, in the Shabaka patterns. And as we well know, the balance that we strive for in classical ballet, on doing everything on both sides. Not every uh, inscription from Kemet has this kind of, um, has this kind of direct balance, but this one does. And I find it very interesting. And I find it quite beautiful that, the, that they reflect themselves through um, this idea 
of this, this centralized, almost like uh, liquid force of the soul. And that um, this balance and order, justice, reciprocity, um, example through the deity of Ma'at um, is shown to be of principal importance in this. Um, and these first two lines just talk about how the stone was found, uh, that it was a worm-eaten document, uh, that they wanted to preserve of their ancestors, and that it was uh, important for them to put it on this stone so that it could be preserved for eternity. Now, unfortunately, it was found by a farmer and used as a grinding stone. So the whole middle section of, yes, unfortunately, the whole middle section of this uh, document is lost to us, but there is much of it that survives. And in it, we can see quite a bit of, um, of evidence of frame tails. We see, um, we see the Fibonacci sequence enacted by the numbers uh, that, the, that the gods are emerge um, and all point to the singularity, the zero, the cifra, the, that was also introduced by uh, the Arabs to, and the Moors to Europe. Um, and they're just all of these things that predate Christian, uh, not Christian, well, Christian as well, but uh, Greek classicism. And um, I just wanted to make sure that it was very clear that a lot of uh, white supremacist ideologies end the study of philosophy, science, and all of that at Greece, so that even in the arguments of talking about the importance of the Moors, they say, oh, well, they were basically just carriers of Greek knowledge, instead of saying that they had knowledge of their own, or that the people of India or Syria contributed, or anything else. Um, so it was of the utmost important to me to bring this document to this discussion. So I believe I am a quite a bit over my time. So I will stop here and open the floor for questions. Next slide, please. Um, just so that we can, uh, well, there's the, the golden ratio um, where we have these, these divine numbers. Um, so yeah, so we have covered the Shabaka stone of ancient Kush and how it contains and enacts the philosophies, sciences, atomic cosmology, and the formal artistic qualities that we saw make their way through Persia, Greece, India, and Al-Andalus before making its way into the courts of Europe. The cultural cosmologies and the compositional modes of Al-Andalus, whose atomically interconnected worldview has a ge genealogy that extends beyond Greece to ancient Kush, at least. Um, and the specific point of absorption of the art forms of Al-Andalus into the French courts of Louis the 13th and 14th that include, but are not limited to the uh, Sarabanda and Saraband. And so I've demonstrated in this um, discussion how, these, how this lineage has found its, its own ways all the way through these, all the way through these institutions, these modes of thinking, um, and that uh, we've explored this unity and that it provided a common language for polymaths to exchange information across centuries and wisdom across centuries and fields and time and space. And the resonances from such a strong output of learning continue through the modern explorations of science that is slowly making discoveries that confirm the intuitions and the research of the ancient mystical scientists to be true. Uh, much of what's contained on the Shabaka stone has actually kind of been proven to be our current understanding of the universe as it was, you know, created and as it continues to create itself every day. Um, the continual expansion, evolution, and geometric explorations of the body in Western classical dance is no exception, as the human body over the centuries of ballet's development has become a living, breathing mathematical compass. The geometric base upon which the ballet is built is unavoidable, as is the Africanist influence, a word um, I'm using from Brenda Dixon Gottschild, of the Moors and Kush Kemet. As practitioners, choreographers, directors, and funders, we must reassess the extra-European references in De Vega, Rebel, Luli, and the European relationship to Al-Andalus in relation to ballet's history. The descriptions of the Sarabanda or Saraband embodied a relationship with foreignness that was complicated as the Africanist aesthetics, aesthetics in the period were at once rejected and admired. Many of these dances and cultural absorptions were seen as threatening to Europe's false sense of national and ethnic stability. 
as shown by the Spanish Inquisition. These fraught relations, however, and the deliberate erasure of the history of by endeavors like the Inquisition would only mask a kind of Bloomian anxiety of influence that plagues Europe history. This history is slowly being pieced together by the remaining fragments that were overlooked, left behind, or kept intact because they were simply seen as too valuable to jettison. Choreographers like William Forsyth and Alonzo King are two choreographers who are doing the work, along with many other scholars cited here of piecing together these fragments and excavating the wisdom in ballet's form and these erased histories in their choreography. Like Shabaka patterns and the Shabaka stone, ballet has wisdom within its deep structures, in the science enacted to, in, to execute its steps and in the discipline required for its practice that can be applied to life to process existential concerns. We have many more pieces of this episodic history to put together and questions to ask of them so that we don't simply reflect toxically curated histories and traditions, we can contextualize and correct them. Thank you. So now um, we will open the floor for any questions that any of you may have. And yeah, we can stop screen sharing so we can see the people. Let's see. Oh, um, I think we have a question here. I think. Before you conclude the fossils, equipped with what you have taught us, where does ballet as a hyper specific discipline go from here? Maybe it becomes less specific, more fluid, more disciplinarity. Maybe disciplinarity is the problem. How can we use knowledge practically for the futurity of ballet? Does it open up choreographic possibilities, acceptable bodies for ballet. Yeah. So thank you, Molly. Um, I think that the practice of ballet itself has, though it m most of its history as we know it has been in court situations and in particular uh, contexts like dance studios that impose their particular ideas of what the form should look like. I think that it's practice and it was something that I, I was fortunate to have teachers that didn't uh, espouse these white supremacist ideals. I had a couple here and there, but um, in terms of body image, anybody and everybody can enact these principles. I've seen it done. Um, not that I've seen it done. It just doesn't really matter what your body looks like if you're trying to find balance. That's something that we all have to do in life in general. And so just the principle of balance, order, reciprocity, those things, um, equal give and take, like those things are things that are not exclusive to, to um, Europe. Um, and they're classical, principles that extend to all cultures. Um, I just highlighted the African one. Um, and I think that bringing attention to the, these principles, how they apply to life, the meditative quality of ballet, the kind of focus that it takes when you're not thinking about, oh, my leg is not high enough. Oh, my foot is not pointed enough. Um, just enacting these geometries in the body, in space, being in communion with your body and where it is on a day-to-day -day basis, that's a meditative practice. Um, and so I think a lot of these things will melt away um, once you know, we, we look less at what white supremacy has done to this uh, physicalization of geometries. Uh, we have another question. Thanks for all the connections and uninvisibilizing. Can you talk a little bit more about how you found Forsyth and King referring to deeper roots that relate to your research? Yes, so um, Forsyth's 
one of his more recent ballets, uh, the 2018 Quiet Evening of Dance, looks at how ballet emerged from, as in his words, orthogonal mentalities, mentalities that relate to right angles, 90 degrees, you know, geometries, all those kinds of things. And um, in the, in, there are sections in the ballet, one in particular, where we see him using the, the, the Laban grid in the body, outside of the body, and finding different points where the feet themselves, once we establish that there are these points in space, the feet, the feet go from a parallel position to a turned out position to enable more movement into these various positions. And we see a very, very, very organic evolution that just comes through exploration of the two dancers. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, I'm hoping that it goes back on tour again so that you all can see um, it, it's, this, it's the second uh, movement of the ballet. And again, even in the opening movement, it has to do with uh, creation. And in his own words, he has the, the, the first couple as, as a, that they're a married couple. And he developed it from their dynamic with each other and their love with each other and kind of showing this urgency between the two of them and how they come together through these geometries, through these, these, these vectors and these angles and how they diverge and come back together and all these different things. So, and the whole ballet is built on these, uh, on these phrases, on this development of moving the, the, the points in space. I almost feel crazy to do this, but the, the different points in space moving from the body to outside of the body, to planes, to these diagonals and how they come out of the body, enter the body, through the body, all of those different things. Um, King, his belief, and I agree with him, um, is basically what I, I told you about. Um, he also gave me a lot of great leads. This whole talk is basically, you know, kind of what we talked about on the phone as well. Just this lineage from the Twa and Bhuti people all the way through into the courts. Um, and so uh, he didn't tell me exactly where to look. So that was all the work I had to do. But people like him and Kaba uh, Kamene, um, they were like, here, we've got the West. All you need to know basically is they took all they have essentially from their surrounding nations. And a lot of those surrounding nations took what they have from these ancient civilizations like ancient Egypt, Kemet, Kush, Sumer, all that kind of stuff. Um, particularly the fact that, um, you know, these geometries and science, you know, that the enlightenment was so very uh, racist. You know, they were just like, there was no, literally I saw this, there's no a uh, history to Africa. They have no history, they have no science, they have no math, they can't think. Their animals, like all of that stuff. Like I saw them write it. And I think that's what we've been fighting against this whole time. Um, so yeah, they're, they've been interrogating ballet's history for, you know, since. Um, one of the earliest quotes that I saw King give about this history, and I put it on the Instagram, was um, that was from their 2000s, but I found another one that was from the 90s. So it's been around for a while. Uh, let's see. Hi, Jabril. Wonder how we can change the structure of traditional ballet class to be a more mindful, safe place. Now that we know more about the interconnectedness of the body to the earth and the culture that gave us these bodily ideas. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Fisher, for coming to. Thank you, Maida Goldberg. Um, yes. Um, the way I teach ballet, and it's been this way for a while, even before I knew this history has just much more to do with kind of how I've been describing linking the principles of ballet, you know, balance, repetition, order, a mindfulness of where your body is today versus yesterday. Those things, I think if we amplify that and decolonize our own minds of what ballet is supposed to look like um, and go more about how you enact the principles, the rest will fall into place. When you talk about rotations, when you talk about freeing the hip, when you talk about you know opposing directions, like all of those things, they have nothing to do with you know how high your leg is, how 
snatched you are, as some people might say, or, you know, if people even say that at all. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that's helpful. Just, just using the space as a meditative practice um, that you can come back to every, uh, every day. Um, let's see, pushing more. Hey, Chris, um, pushing more into a 21st century aesthetics of ballet and concert dance in general. How do you, as a Black performer and choreographer, grapple with the popularization of Black aesthetics and vernaculars within ballet's white choreographers? Great question, most famously by William Forsyth, who make the art form more contemporary and therefore more whitewashed. Where, whereas some, someone like King, who has been using African vernaculars in his work, are way less popularized and celebrated. Yeah, I think that's... Um, but you know, I'm, th I'm glad you asked this question because during this research into Al Andalus and into Kush, the same thing has been happening since forever. You know, we, we, we know it more popular with rock and roll. Um, you know, we see the, our music history documentaries and stuff like that and see how a lot of people were taking from Motown, like wholesale. Um, it's basically um, the same thing. Now, Forsyth, I would argue, um, as an American that grew up in the 60s and as a person that I don't really see as kind of like co-opting Black culture, but as a person who kind of grew up under Black culture um, and, and has a type of respect for it, it seems that he's not necessarily, in my opinion, uh, monopolizing on it. I think, hey, y'all, I'm getting a strong side eye. And, and yeah, we can open up the floor for a discussion. This won't be a unilateral thing. I would very much like to invite discussion on this. Um, and every time I've heard him talk about this himself, he's like, it would be no me if it weren't for these dancers. And he's always talking about funk. He's always talking about all these things that are, that are important to um, his aesthetic. And so I think that he, I think that he has a respect, and I think that's the difference between like appropriation and like someone who is like in and kind of a part of what was happening in a kind of cultural milieu, you know what I mean? And not giving honor to what he was pulling from. Because even when I interviewed him, he mentioned a lot of this history to me. And I think that was one of his impulses in choreographing Quiet Evening and in highlighting the geometries and not having them dressed in, you know, the white wigs and powdered faces and like all that kind of stuff. Like he has them dressed in contemporary dress and all this kind of stuff. So I think he has a different kind of, um, a different kind of relationship to it um, as opposed to some other things that I've seen that um, even from within the black community that seem to do more kind of, prostituting of Black culture um, into a, mm, into a balletic context in a way that the things don't necessarily harmonize, if that makes sense. And I see, I see the work that Forsyth does is a little bit more organic than that, instead of just like mashing, you know, like the nay nay with being on point or something like the hip comes from going off balance, if that makes sense. But Chris, do you want to say something else? And you can unmute, please feel free. <laughs> Great um, to see you, by the way. <laughs> Thanks hi, for coming. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Jabril. Um, <laughs> if someone does something more masterfully, does it mean it's right? Hmm. Well, I think and they're not profiting from it as much as someone else because they do it better. I think that, in my opinion, a lot of it goes back to the kind of homage and respect that you pay to where you get the stuff from. And I think that's why, for me, I don't see his work as problematic because every time, every interview I've seen of him talk about this issue, he mentions the Black culture. He mentions the Black dancers in his company. Um, and, you know, it's been noted that, you know, he was one of the early people to hire all those Black dancers when other ballet companies were not um, and were leaning on their expertise. And it doesn't seem to me like he was just like kind of pimping them out. It seems like let's create something that ballet is not doing that it should be doing, 
you know, um, and it seems like there's an integrity. There's the word I was looking for. <laughs> to me, there, I, I, I feel like there's integrity in the work that he does. Um, and, you know, he's the one, when I was talking to him, was making sure he's like, make sure you talk to Alonzo. I'm like, yep, we talk to Alonzo. Like, he's like, they, they, these are things that it seems like are on his mind as a creator, um, more so than many other choreographers and I can't even really name any right now because I've kind of dropped out <laughs> of the scene because of my uh, disappointment with the state of choreography at the moment but um I won't dwell on that are there you have another response I feel like you've got something else brewing you can have a side combo for for this okay I'd love to I'd love to thank you so much let's see are there any other questions? I'm also kind of seeing these. Any other questions? It's an open floor. Um, anybody who wants to uh, who wants to jump in and say something, comment, questions. Another I, have a, I have a question. Oh, I, sure. First, I want to just thank you for taking us like so deep and so specific and really getting into the granularity. And, and like, I think sometimes people aren't willing to like sit with going like as far deep and, you know, scratching and scratching and scratching and going further and further and further back. And that's why we get these really sort of like lazy histories of things. So <laughs> I really, really appreciate you kind of doing that work and sharing it with us and bringing it forward. And I'm, I'm curious to kind of riffing off some of the other questions of like how, you know, does how does like surfacing this information and kind of like integrating it into your practice, like how does that manifest now? Like, are there differences in the ways that you approach ballet today than, you know, before you kind of took this really deep dive or is it, you know, is it sort of maybe a like a uh, affirmation of things that you felt no knew? Like, how does that kind of like register right now in your current artistic practice? Yeah, and I, I'm also seeing that uh, Antoine is asking a similar question. So I'll try to merge all of these together. Um, I, I'll admit it, it seemed more to, because I didn't really think about it that much. I also didn't necessarily I mean, I felt it in some ways, but I think I was very fortunate to not have like white supremacy dominate the ballet classrooms that I was in. Um, I may have been one of a few here and there, and I would also get like side eye glances. I walked into Boston Ballet's audition when I was like in maybe ninth grade and everybody like literally like moms and everybody were like, what are you doing here? And my mom tried to get like keep me from doing ballet for a long time. She herself was a dancer and got a whole lot of the white supremacy in her uh, experience. And so also a lot of this work is for her as well. Um, but what it really did, well, first of all, it, it changed my life because there was a kind of... Um, my whole position and posture in relation to how we address these issues has changed. We no longer need to ask for anything, beg to be in anybody's company um, because of you're upholding this monolithic thing like, oh yeah, well, you think you can do this? Well, we've always, we, this ballet thing is us. So we, you, we can keep you from it. It's like, actually you can't because that's ours too. Like you would not have ballet without us, without people of color, without people of African descent. So um, it basically liberated me. It liberated my practice. There was a lot of times where I felt like I had to justify my love for ballet um, to people who were like, why are you doing this white person's art form? And I'm like, well, it's not white. <laughs> it's like it's it's not um what has been done to it is another thing but the principles um the the the, the physicalizing of science is not uh white and um and literally like each time when I got to 
you know, when I had the fifth position lightning bolt moment where I saw and felt the architecture of Al Andalus in my body, and then I encountered the Shabaka stone and started analyzing it closely, even before I really knew what it said, and seeing classicism and just the beauty of the form and it enacting the very principles it was containing within the hieroglyphs. I like my body was like, it felt like I was electrified. Like for the next three days, I had these crazy dreams that were so beautiful. Like it, it really felt like a, a, a coming home, if that makes sense. And it felt like, and, and my, my homage to the ancestors, I really feel like I've been led every step of the way because there's so much literature to shift through, to sift through. And so feeling, feeling the affirmations, feeling the, yes, you are here. Yes, you are here. Yes, we are here. Yes, we are here. Like it just seemed, um, it seemed like I had finally been able to establish my lineage to my home as not only a person of African descent, but, a pers but an artist. Because a lot of these things I like to create, I, I, I aim to create with my own art, um, to preserve the art of my ancestors, to have this m blending of art, science, spirit that liberates the people that see it. And so, especially when I saw the Shabaka Stone, I was like, this is, what, this is what I've been wanting to do like my whole life, my whole life. Like this is what I've been trying to do. Um, and so, you know, I, as much as I would like to do, you know, what is it, 23andMe and Ancestry.com and all that kind of stuff, this feels more, um, regardless of whatever those uh, scientific things come back to say, this feels like, you know, my, my home. And it was more of a, a, a search for self than anything else, I think, at the end of it. Um, let me just make sure I'm not missing any questions. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Been most surprised. What's the most surprising in this work is just how far back this stuff goes. Um, I think that's been the, the thing that's been the most surprising. Um, let's see, thank you for representing presenting this research. I would love for other folks to see this. Yes, it will be recorded. I think Abby, you answered that. Um, this question. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Hey, Panika, so good to see you. Um, as I see, as I see, yes, we will definitely have more conversations about this. Um, thank you, thank you all. Um, are there any other questions, comments? Before we wrap up, I will say, um, so I, I mentioned uh, that I'm also an artist. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, you can go to my website, jabriljackson.com. You can, um, and I often, I use my research for the films I create. I create story ballets for film um, and write the stories and do all that kind of stuff. Um, there, I am currently in the revision stages of a script that details this history through six friends to try to find a way to, to synthesize it in a way that's absorbable and to have a whole ballet for that. So be on the lookout um, for however that is. Also looking for funding. So if you know anybody with some money that wants to fund a brand new ballet film, let me know. Um, and yeah, I will have um, my first film that is on my website now, it will be on Amazon very soon. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we have the websites in the link. Thank you, Ava Gordy. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, am I missing anything? Aaliyah, is this where you step yeah, in? Yeah, I'll jump in here. I really just want to thank everyone who stayed. I, it was a deep and intricate, and there's a lot to digest. And so um, our motto for Dancers Amplified this year is just really bringing in the whole dancer. So like seeing ourselves as artists, scholars, humans, and bring all of that 
into our work um, as we move forward and continue to kind of dismantle white supremacy within ballet. Um, so one of our calls to action, I'm going to kind of post something in the chat is um, da -da, to uh, think about how this is resonating in your body. I know I feel pretty like electrified in my body too right now and I want to move and kind of get some of this out. So um, if you are interested in submitting some um, recordings of you moving or responding to this work, we welcome that and it can be shared with us via our website or on Instagram and I've just um, typed that into the chat right now. And then additionally, um, we are continuing to uh, program these dancers amplified present conversations um, throughout the year on different topics um, from our community members that are involved with DA, but also other folks that want to come in and share and really like start these discussions. And so we really appreciate any support that people can give in the form of a donation. And I have put the link in the chat where you can make a small donation. A little bit of donation goes a long way in helping us to uh, put more information like this into the world and also to help us kind of continue to grow as an organization. And um, we're in the very nascent stages of building this community here. Um, and then I also want to point your attention um, lastly to some work that's already out there. So you can visit, again, I'll repost our DA website and the Global Active, Practice docu Global Active Practices document that is circulating out in the world. It's a document um, that was brilliantly um, written and edited and drafted by a large community of dancers, but kind of synthesized um, to live on our website, which is um, a tool that we are hoping to share with folks across dance organizations. So leadership, artists, um, you know, executive folks who are um, running the companies, funders, really to see how everyone can do their part in helping to dismantle, um, you know, really harmful practices within the ballet industry. Um, and then kind of like larger dance communities as well um, beyond ballet too. So please take a look at that if you haven't had a chance, there's something in there for everyone. And it's again, another sort of rich document with a lot of information. So we encourage you to take it in um, bit by bit, maybe section by section. And if you're interested in um, joining us to actually work through the document together, um, you know, as a community, we have this th these things called jam sessions where we actually kind of take it apart, embody it, put it into motion, have discussions around different tenets of the document, of the practices that we can do in our daily lives and in our communities to really continue to be the change that we want to see in this industry. So be on the lookout. Um, our next um, jam session will be happening in March. And so be on the lookout for um, that information on Instagram. That's our primary form of uh, communication out into the publics um for when that is and hopefully many of you will join us there and i did post earlier but i want to say it again um a really big thank you to black dance change makers and the international association of blacks and dance for being partners in this work and for all of y'all for being here and everyone who liked shared commented <laughs> on instagram follow us on ig if you can um and yeah i think that's pretty much all i had to say to wrap it up i'm I just personally am super thankful for this information and just grateful to be able to do it amongst community so that we're not kind of having all of our knowledge in these silos and like little side conversations, but that these, these can be sort of like public conversations that continue to ripple through and hopefully continue to change things for the better. So Gabby, <laughs> Jabril, anything else you want to <laughs> say before we say goodbye to the folks? No, just thank you all for joining us. And I, I hope you were empowered by this and hope that you will take this information and empower the people that you connect with it so that we don't have to be oppressed by art anymore <laughs> and that we can just make it and enjoy it. Um, yes, thank you all.